Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. As our spring semester draws to a close for our Marver H. Bernstein Symposium. And I wish to begin by expressing our deepest appreciation to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for joining us here on campus today. It's an honor to welcome her to Gaston Hall and to hear her reflections this afternoon. And I also wish to express our gratitude to the Honorable Robert Katzman, Chief Judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, for all his efforts to make this extraordinary symposium possible for our community. I look forward to sharing a few more words about Judge Katzman in just a moment. I'd also like to thank Professor Mary Hartnett and Professor Wendy Williams from our Georgetown Law Center, who will join Justice Ginsburg in conversation today. Professor Hartnett and Professor Williams are Justice Ginsburg's authorized biographers and co-authors of her recent book, My Own Words, published this past year. Finally, I wish to thank all of you for being here today for this very special gathering. The Bernstein Symposium was created to honor the memory of Marver and Shava Bernstein. Dr. Marver Bernstein, whose work in the areas of regulation, personnel and administrative reform continues to influence scholars today. He served as the founding dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, as president of Brandeis, and for the last seven years of his life as a professor of politics and philosophy here at our School of Foreign Service. We're deeply grateful to Michael and Susan Gelman and all those who have generously supported this symposium and enabled us to bring such esteemed guests to campus, including Vice President Al Gore, journalist Tim Russert, Senator Patrick Leahy, and Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Stephen Breyer to take part in this forum, which honors Dr. Bernstein's many contributions to our university community and to our understanding of the US political system. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Since her confirmation to the court nearly 25 years ago, she's brought a thoughtful, measured approach to her distinguished service on the bench, building consensus and voicing eloquence in dissent. We're deeply honored to have her with us this afternoon to share her, ins her insights and reflections with our Georgetown community. To introduce Justice Ginsburg, it's my pleasure to welcome Chief Judge Robert Katzman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Judge Katzman was appointed to the federal bench in 1999 by President Clinton, and he began his service as chief judge 14 years later in 2013. Like his mentor in this symposium's namesake, Marva Bernstein, Judge Katzman is also an engaged member of our Georgetown community, having taught at the Walsh, as the Walsh Professor of Government and as Professor of Law and Public Policy. He currently serves on the Board of Visitors of our Law Center and is also one of the founders of this symposium. Before his appointment to the Second Circuit, he was a fellow of the Governmental Studies Program of the Brookings Institution and served as president of the Governance Institute. In 2001, he received the Charles E. Merriam Award from the American Political Science Association. In 2003, he was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2011, received the Chesterfield Smith Award from the Pro Bono Institute in recognition of his outstanding dedication to pro bono work, including programs regarding immigration. This award was presented to him by Justice Ginsburg, who engaged his guidance and expertise when he served as special counsel pro bono to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan and then Judge Ginsburg during her confirmation process to the Supreme Court. Bob, it is wonderful to welcome you back to campus this afternoon. I want to thank you again for your leadership, your generosity, and your sustained commitment to our community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Robert Katzman. It's great to be back. Thank you, President DeJoya, for your generous introduction, for elevating our proceedings with your presence, and I might add, for your efforts to promote 
understanding on some very difficult issues that confront our society. It was Marva Bernstein's idea that Georgetown should create a position that would bridge the campuses between the Law Center downtown and the main campus. And he worked with the, the Law Center to make that a reality. As a beneficiary of that effort, I will always be grateful to him. The Bernstein Symposium brings the campuses together. And our program this afternoon draws upon the talents of the main campus and the Georgetown Law Center faculty. I know that my friend Bill Trainer, Dean of the Law School, uh, regrets being out of town today, and we appreciate his participation in previous years. This symposium series is very dear to me, and I'm very grateful to still be part of it, and grateful to the government department and its distinguished chair, Charles King, for all of his wise counsel. I, I am also very grateful to all those friends of Marva Bernstein who made this symposium possible, including the Gelmans who uh, President DeJoya mentioned. Now, this is for me this afternoon a particularly special occasion for several reasons. Music has always been important to me as it is for so many people. What else but music can give a person a sensation both soothing and inspiring, a transporting experience, and have rich associations in its wake in the memory? Be it the notes of Verde or Beyonce, Stephen Sondheim or Philip Glass, there's some music out there that speaks to each of us, something universal. So it is a distinct thrill for me to introduce as our Bernstein honoree someone who demonstrably understands something about universal values, and someone who, in fact, has performed twice on the opera stage with a Washington National Opera at the Kennedy Center, no less. A Washington Post story recently praised our guest for not only her performance, but for her writing as well, and I quote, her timing, delivery, and material, which she wrote herself, were all even more polished and hit every mark. The headline observed, before adoring crowds, justice prevails. <laughs> justice, writing, superb delivery. I think you know where I'm headed here. The Post story was indeed not about the reaction to Justice Ginsburg's reading of a consequential opinion from the Supreme Court bench, or the reaction to one of her well-crafted speeches to a university or a bar group. No, the Washington Post story really was a review of Justice Ginsburg, already acknowledged as a veritable rock star in the story, as also, and I quote, an actual opera star. Wrote Anne Midget, on Thursday night, March 9th, the Kennedy Center Opera House was filled with an adoring crowd that roared with adulation for her at every opportunity. Ginsburg rules Washington National Opera, another Washington Post headline read. Justice Ginsburg is, uh, of course, also a Supreme Court justice, a national icon. <laughs> the subject of books, pop art, t-shirts, and I understand soon a movie starring Natalie Portman. It's true. Why is, why, is, in, why is this, in fact, so? In part, Justice Ginsburg is celebrated for her impact as a judge on this country's highest court, the second woman ever on the court, for her path-marking contributions to the law's developments, for her methodical, brilliant analyses, and concise, elegant prose. In part, no doubt, it is because of her trailblazing role before becoming a judge as a lawyer's advocate on behalf of women's rights. But I think it is also because the American public admires her character, her values, and feel a connection with her. And I witnessed that connection firsthand, as President DeJoya noted, in the, in the course of her confirmation journey in the summer of 1993, when she was first thrust into national celebrity, when I accompanied her on Capitol Hill at the invitation of her Senate sponsor, Daniel Patrick 
Moynihan, an experience that I will always cherish. For me, the most telling moment of that confirmation hearing came in re response to a question from Senator Cole of Wisconsin. And he asked her, how would she want the American people to think of her? And Ruth Bader Ginsburg replied quietly, I would like to be thought of as a person who cares about people and does the best she can with the talent she has to make a contribution to a better world. That, I think, captures Justice Ginsburg's essence. She is a person with seemingly limitless capacity for friendship and kindness in ways large and small, no matter the weighty burdens of her daily life. She is a friend for the chilly winters of life, someone who places others before her own convenience, as I have observed, someone of conviction and determination, a person with a true sense of the aesthetic, taken by the simple pleasures of life has to offer, be it a beloved aria or a horseback ride. And to know her family, her incomparable partner, Marty, and her accomplished children, and her, indeed her entire family, is to have a sense of what for her are life's blessings and makes each of us appreciate what is truly important. Justice Ginsburg is someone of grace, prodigious work habits, good humor, dignity, and style. So in Justice Ginsburg, the public observes someone for whom the law is not about abstractions. Her life in the law has been and continues to be about working to ensure that each of us can realize his or her potential. For her, life can entail the most difficult of challenges, both professional and personal, but she has always been determined to meet them, to struggle through the obstacles, to secure a better future for those of us here now and those who follow. So that enduring connection that she established with the American people who watched the confirmation hearings was based on their perception that in this age, too often gripped by glitz and self-promotion, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was someone whose virtues were and are very real. And early on, I could sense that connection as persons of all ages approached her for an autograph and she agreed with friendliness. I think it's actually very affirming of our country and of ourselves that this intellectual powerhouse woman draws huge crowds and is a fixture extolled in pop culture. The occasion of our Marva Bernstein program is the recent publication of my own work, which is a collection of Justice Ginsburg's writings. It's a great read, and I can't recommend it enough. Indeed, everybody here will get a copy. The book has been wildly heralded in book reviews as a collection of thoughtful writing about perseverance and community and the law, reflecting an abiding commitment to protect outsiders and others as a core American value, as a tonic to the current national discourse, showcasing the justices' astonishing intellectual range from law and lawyers in opera to tributes to Louis Brandeis, William Rehnquist, and Gloria Steinem, paying tributes to those who came before her and others who work with her. As writing, my own words is a model for all of us, precise, varied, beautiful, structured, like a wonderful piece of music. Joining me in conversation now are uh, Justice Ginsburg and her two colleagues on the project, Mary Hartnett, an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law who focuses on international women's rights, and Wendy Williams, professor of law emerita at Georgetown Law, best known for her work on the subjects of gender and law. Please join me now as we welcome Justice Ginsburg and her colleagues on stage for a conversation.
Wow, I've never heard such applause. That's uh, <laughs> in a university institution. That's really uh, extraordinary. Just uh, um, Justice Ginsburg, if I if I might begin, uh, why this book of writings and and why now? The original plan, Bob was that. Wendy and Mary would write a biography, my authorized biography. You two started, was it the year 2004 when you Why? came to me? Yeah, they came to me and said, someone is going to write about you. So you might as well designate people you trust. Mm. And we, we volunteer. So the, the idea was that they would write the biography. And then as a supplement, we would have a collection of my writings. 2004 became 2010. And <laughs> <laughs> so I suggested, why not flip the order, do the book of writings first, and then bi the biography? And you two were very enthusiastic about that idea. So was your publisher. <laughs> <laughs> and someday. Someday, maybe they can tell you when the biography will appear. <laughs> well, it's such a bestseller as it is. You know, it's, it'll be some lead, on, lead time before the book is actually published. So no, tell, pressure, tell, no pressure on us. So tell, tell us, Wendy and, and, and Mary, uh, uh, about the process of gathering and, and choosing the materials to be published. So maybe I'll start. Um, but first, the the forthcoming biography, we can't publish yet because Justice Ginsburg keeps doing amazing things, and we need to cover them all. <laughs> but selecting the materials was a lot of fun, but I have to tell you it wasn't easy, and here's why. Justice Ginsburg is an extraordinarily prolific writer and speaker, and not just as a Supreme Court justice, not just as a judge, not just as a law professor or a litigator. For the first piece in the collection, we actually went back over 70 years to a piece that Justice Ginsburg wrote when she was in eighth grade. <laughs> it probably won't surprise you to know she was the editor of her school newspaper, in public school in Brooklyn. The name of the paper was The Highway Herald. And the piece that is uh, the first piece in this book, she wrote again when she was in eighth grade. The other items in the school newspaper talked about the circus, the school play. But young Ruth wrote about the Ten Commandments, <laughs> the Magna Carta, <laughs> the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the United Nations Charter, which had just been uh, adopted. Mm -hmm. so, so. so you can understand the enormity of trying to select just enough to fill a book as opposed to Gaston Hall. And so Wendy and I met with Justice Ginsburg and kind of got a big picture of the shape we thought we wanted the book to be in, and then Wendy and I exchanged 28 drafts of an outline. And then the great thing about working with Justice Ginsburg is she has a phenomenal memory. So we would talk about a particular speech, and she would say, we might want to consider the version I gave in Paris in 2008, where I talked about Brown v. Board of Education. And uh, so we did, and, and Justice Ginsburg has an amazing staff led by Kim McKenzie, who would then go actually find that piece. So we were aided in that. The other fun part about selecting the pieces is we also needed to select photographs. And so Justice Ginsburg, when she was speaking at Georgetown Law last year, came in advance of her speech into my office, which is literally wallpapered with pictures of Justice Ginsburg at every stage of her life, um, and of Marty and her family. And so we had a fun time with Dean Trainer, picking out different photos for the book. 
And then finally, the last part was writing the introductory material. And Justice Ginsburg wrote a beautiful introduction to the book. And then Wendy and I had a challenge in that writing an introduction to each section. We couldn't just put in the whole chapters we've already written for the forthcoming biography. We had to winnow out just a, a few of the key parts um, and leave something for the future. So we did that. Then Wendy, did you want to? Oh, just a few words. Um, first of all, I just have to do a shout out to Mary because she keeps me on track and on time, which is, as anybody who knows me knows, is an incredible job. <laughs> And she, and she has been the go-between um, among the three of us, making sure that we all produce and when we are going to produce and what we want to do, and telling us there are certain things that can't go in the book because we have a page limit. So, so that's what I lived through. And I, it was a stressful, extremely stressful, but it was also wonderful. Um, and I think it's fair to say that one of our goals, consistent with what we know of the justice, was, um, was that we would make it accessible, not just to lawyers and the legal profession, but um, to the general public as well. And I hope we achieve that goal. You, you will be the judge of that, because you will all have the book soon, and, and you can let us know whether you think we did it right or not. Um, and, of course, the main job was to capture the essence of the justice's style, which is unique, and her substance, which is a remarkable performance, and somehow boil it down uh, to its essence and present it uh, in a book. Um, so I, I want to say um, our efforts I just can't help myself, I have to throw this in. Our efforts include not just her own words, um, but, uh, but a couple other little tidbits as well. And one of them, well, you already know that she's a, she loves the opera, right? She, she, she starred in an opera. Well, not quite starred, but. <laughs> and, and the problem is, she can't sing very well. <laughs> So, she said, if she could, she'd be a diva. But as it was, she has a pretty good job uh, as a Supreme Court justice. So, w one of the things we include in the, it, included in the book is, um, is an excerpt from an opera. And some of you may have heard of it. It's called Scalia Ginsburg. Uh, and you get a little taste of, of, of an opera about the Supreme Court and these two justices uh, in this book. And the second thing um, I'm especially fond of here is there are two, two, well, excerpts really from two speeches in honor of the justice by a splendid guy Ruth Ginsburg calls her life partner. Um, the late great tax lawyer and law professor at Georgetown, Martin Ginsburg, known to all as Marty. Uh, so I think you'll find things in there that are uh, attuned to who she is, but by some others. And at the core of it is our effort together to present you with the essence of what she believes and how she operates and how she thinks and what she has contributed. So that's it. Justice Ginsburg, uh, before you were on the Supreme Court, you, of course, litigated in front of the Supreme Court. And in the 1970s, you were head litigator at, in the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU. You took part in 34 cases before the Supreme Court as either lead litigator or co-litigator. You won five out of six cases. You argued there. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you developed your legal strategy? In those not so good old days, the legal strategy was clear. The first was to convince judges that there was such a thing as gender-based discrimination. And by the 70s, I think 
jurists well appreciated that race discrimination was odious. But they tended to think of differential treatment of women as operating benignly in women's favor. So the Supreme Court never saw a gender discrimination case that regarded as anything but favor to the woman. So we'll go back to, is Bradwell v. Illinois, uh, 1872 or 73? But anyway, this uh, woman- 73. Qualified to be a member of the Illinois State Bar in all respects but one, the one, she was a woman. And the court could rationalize that by saying, well, unpleasant things sometimes go on in courtrooms and the lady wouldn't want to be present. Uh, or the next one, uh, we can take Gossard against Cleary. By the way, that will be reenacted at the Supreme Court on Monday. Yes. This is a 1948 case. The Michigan Supreme Court passed, uh, the Michigan legislature passed a law that said women may not tend bar unless they are the wife or the daughter of the male bar owner. When that came to the Supreme Court, the opinion is rather glib, but it does talk uh, about unseemly things going on at taverns and saloons, best to keep the dainty little woman out. <laughs> Or even later, in 1961, it was the case of Gwendolyn Hoyt who stood trial for the murder of her philandering, abusive husband. There were no women on Florida juries. Mm. And the Supreme Court saw that as a favor to women. Women, after all, were the center of home and family life. Therefore, they should not be distracted by being called away from the home for jury duty. So the objective was to let the court understand that these classifications, far from favoring women, kept her, as Justice Brennan said in sometime in the 1970s, not on a pedestal, but in a cage. Mm -hmm. Now that was the job first to persuade the triers, that there was such a thing as gender-based discrimination. And then the, the laws that were our immediate target were laws that Wendy Williams described so well as, as creating separate spheres for people. So there was the woman who took care of the home and the children, and the man who took care of the family's economic well-being. And many, many laws were, were written with that picture of how life should be organized in mind. So the effort was to say, there's something wrong with that picture of the world. There are many women who are not particularly um, good at the home job, but may be very good as firefighter or police all those were off limits to women at the time. And there are many men who genuinely care for children. So the law should speak about parents rather than mother or father. The object was to break down all those explicit gender-based distinctions so that people could be, as um, it was Mar Marla Thomas expressed it, people would be free to be you and me. Whatever your God-given talents, you could pursue it, and your being male or female should not hold you back. So, Wendy, maybe you would like to, to add to that, because in the 70s, Wendy was a principal litigator for an organization in, based in San Francisco called Equal Rights Advocates. Still in existence and going strong. Well, it was an amazing 10 years, really nine years, I guess, that Ruth Ginsburg led the burgeoning women's legal movement in this country. And part of her strategy was 
she used to, she, she, she taught law on top of being this Supreme Court litigator. And she was very focused on teaching, <laughs> schooling um, the justices rather than uh, attacking them or bullying them in any way. And she did it brilliantly. She, at one point, um, I guess actually in, in, in the very early cases, tried to get the court to understand that while race discrimination and sex discrimination are by no means identical phenomena, they both need to be closely scrutinized by courts to um, ensure equal protection of the laws for women and for people of color. So, so she tried to get the court to do that. And characteristically, <laughs> I would say, when the Supreme Court didn't quite bring itself to do that, she picked a middle approach and brought them along. And then, in the end, she went on the Supreme Court and got to write an opinion that pulled that all together for all time, called Frontiero versus Richardson. Let me, if, if, I, if I might, um, uh, ask you about uh, your views about uh, dissents. There's a, a very uh, thoughtful reading in the, in the book uh, about uh, the role of dissents. Uh, you discuss the importance of respecting an opponent's view, even when publicly uh, disagreeing, uh, as you exhibited, for example, in Shelby uh, versus uh, Holder. Um, the Voting Rights Act case, you talk about dissents and how Justice Brandeis would sometimes uh, write a dissent and then not, not publish it. There's a whole book of, of uh, his unpublished dissents. Could you give us a sense, Justice Ginsburg, of uh, your philosophy of uh, dissents when you write a dissent? How you think about dissents? I had great role models in that respect, Brandeis and Holmes. I think it was Holmes who said, if I dissented in every case where I thought the court got it wrong, no one would read my dissents. <laughs> so I'm going to save them for the ones that really matter. I keep on my desk the unpublished opinions of Mr. Justice Brandeis. It's, these were opinions that, that Brandeis had labored over, but then in the end, he thought, what the court had done wouldn't do any harm, so he would bury it. It would become a graveyard dissent. So his view was that his voice would be all the more compelling if he husbanded yeah, his dissents for when it Sorry. really mattered. And Cardozo was the same kind of justice. Um, a great law professor, Paul Freund, who clerked for Brandeis, remarked that this then new justice, Cardozo, very often, when it came down to the published opinion, suppressed his vote at conference. Many times he voted one way at the conference, but then joined the court's opinion, going the other way, always on the view that what the court was doing would do no harm. It was OK. And so I, I do not take every opportunity to dis dissent. I do try to save them uh, for when it, when it counts, when it, when it really matters. Can I jump in for one second? Absolutely. Another example of Justice Ginsburg's generosity with her time is I taught a course this semester on the role of dissenting opinions. And we had a surprise guest lecturer one evening. And I thought Justice Ginsburg's security detail was going to have to administer CPR to at least half of the students <laughs> when they realized it was Justice Ginsburg. But thank you again for doing that. <laughs> In your, uh, in, your, in your book, you include your uh, Rose Garden uh, acceptance speech, uh, which I remember well, and your Senate confirmation hearing opening statement. 
Uh, looking back, what, what stands out to you about the nomination confirmation experience? One vivid memory is of a very bright, thin young man who was my guide. He was appointed by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan <laughs> to take me around the halls of, of uh, the congressional office buildings. And Bob, we would be walking to, a, say, a particular senator's office, and and Bob would say, this is what he's interested in. And it would be wise not to talk about this, that, and the other thing <laughs> to this, this gentleman. And that was the Honorable Robert, Robert Katzman. <laughs> what I remember was the collegiality, the civility of those those hearings, that entire process. I was nominated on June 14, 1993, and I was confirmed on August 3rd. Um, there was a truly bipartisan spirit in the Congress. My biggest supporter on the Judiciary Committee was Orrin Hatch, The vote was 96 to 3, and never mind that I had been on the board of the ACLU and co-founder of the Women's Rights Project mm -hmm. and one of four general counsel to the ACLU. Not a single question was asked about my ACLU connection. For Justice Breyer, who came one year after, it was pretty much the same a collegial atmosphere. Watching the most recent confirmations, I wish there was a way that we could wave a magic wand and get back to the way it was and the way, the way it should be. We can only hope. <laughs> we can only hope. But I, 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 what I remember about uh, some things about that process was that the uh, White House uh, brings in uh, experts to talk to the nominee. And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg knew more about each subject than the experts. <laughs> and it was, it was, a, it was really, uh, I think, a very humbling experience for uh, all those coming in. Uh, that, that was really the best week for me because I could choose any law professor I respected to bring me up to speed in various areas of the law. And I realized how popular uh, uh, Ruth Ginsburg was, uh, not just when uh, people would come up to her uh, and ask for an autograph, but the senators across parties all wanted a photo opportunity. <laughs> so we would, we would go in um, to, to talk to a senator, and it became clear that what the senator really wanted was a picture to send back. <laughs> and I also remember very fondly uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, a group from Iowa that was putting on some ice cream demonstration uh, in the Capitol. And he said to uh, uh, then Judge Ginsburg, uh, would you mind coming with me uh, to this ice cream demonstration? And we went. And it was, you know, a, a different time than, than, than we have now. Um, yeah, it was the dairy farmers. Of the dairy farmers, yeah. right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it, it was the most spectacular selection of ice cream in every flavor. Exactly. <laughs> it was delicious, it was delicious, I remember. You have a, a, a new colleague as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, how does the court change uh, when the composition changes? Every time we have a new justice, we have a new court. And that means we will get a photograph of the new court, which I will give to my law clerks when we have it done. 
I think the, the person who is happiest to welcome a new justice is the departing junior justice, <laughs> which is now Justice Kagan, no longer junior justice. The junior justice has the job of uh, opening the door if anyone knocks during a conference, <laughs> answering the telephone, but most daunting at all, of all, staying after we leave and giving all of our decisions, what cases did we grant review, and different whatever actions we took at conference. She relays those to the entourage from the clerk's office, the legal office. Um, and then junior justice of late has had one more assignment. The junior justice serves on the cafeteria committee. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> that was an uphill b battle for Justice Kagan, but she did succeed in getting a frozen yogurt machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's musical chairs, where our seats change. Everything is done by seniority at, at the court. So, and, and you asked about change when a, a new justice comes on board. I think the biggest change in the 24 years I've been there is when Justice O'Connor retired. There have been other changes, but not uh, of the consequence of Justice O'Connor's leaving us. Just from a personal point of view, where there were two of us, and we didn't look alike, and didn't talk alike. But when Justice O'Connor left, there were these eight, most of them rather well-fed men, <laughs> and then there was this small little woman, so the picture was altogether wrong. <laughs> it's true. Now, with three of us, we're spread all over the bench, and that's much better. It was lonely when yeah. Justice O'Connor left. Much better. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, uh, Justice Ginsburg, most, most of the uh, people in our audience today are college students. When you were in college uh, in the 1950s, uh, which classes and professors uh, had, had the biggest impact on you? Well, I've talked about my European literature professor, Vladimir Nabokov, who literally changed the way I read and the way I write. He was a magnificent teacher. But listening to what you said, Bob, when you made that extraordinarily fine introduction, two courses that I took at Cornell University that have stayed with me and enriched my life Music 101 and 102, <laughs> and Fine Arts 101 mm -hmm. and 102. Mm -hmm. So for any of you who are college students, I would recommend whatever, whatever is your main interest, do take courses in music and art. I agree. Uh, you, you, you've made a lot of great decisions in your life, and uh, this, this goes back to something that Wendy had mentioned. Uh, uh, surely a great decision was to, to, uh, to marry uh, Marty Ginsburg. Could you tell us something about that momentous decision? Uh, Marty and I met when he was 18, I was 17. He was in his second year. I was in my first year at Cornell. He had a girlfriend at Smith. I had a boyfriend at Columbia mm -hmm. Law School. <laughs> but there's a long week, often a cold week, <laughs> in Ithaca, New York, in between weekends. So these friends thought it would be, that Marty and I would probably like each other. I could go to the movies with him or to the college spa. And so that's how we started, as, as just friends. Uh, then when Marty gave up, 
his chemistry major because it interfered with golf practice. <laughs> <laughs> he became a, a government. In fairness, he was on the golf team. Yes, he was. Right. He was. <laughs> he, um, then he switched to government, and he would ask, what courses are you taking? And then he would sign up for the same, <laughs> the same courses. Somewhere along the way, I realized that Marty was the first boy, probably the only boy I had ever known who cared that I had a brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine, a college classmate said, Ruth, you are fantastically lucky because Marty is so secure about himself that he will never regard you as any kind of a competitor, any kind of a threat. And Marty, for all the 56 years we spent uh, together, he was always my biggest booster. Yeah. When he went, my first year of law school, Marty was bragging to his classmates that his wife was going to be on the law review. In those days, law review was strictly on the basis of grades, no writing competition. And the only woman on the law review at that time, she said, I looked at you, you were this little twerp, and, <laughs> and, and your husband is bragging about you. And of course, I did make the, the law review. And it, as I said, Marty was my, my biggest booster. And another great thing about him is he, he said he learned early on from two women that it would be good for him to develop skills in the kitchen. <laughs> and he said those two women were his mother and his wife. <laughs> well, I think. It wasn't fair what he said about his mother, but it certainly was about his <laughs> wife. <coughs> we had an arrangement where I would do the everyday cooking, and Marty would be the weekend and company cook. I was never allowed to cook for guests. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter around her early high school years noticed this enormous difference between daddy's cooking and mommy's, <laughs> and decided that mommy should be phased out of the <laughs> So Marty became the only chef in our family. And when I moved to the Supreme Court and the spouses met quarterly for lunch and they shared catering responsibilities, Marty was always the number one pick to, <laughs> to do the lunch. <laughs> There is, in fact, a, a book that you can, you can get at the Supreme Court's gift shop. It's called Supreme Chef, and Supreme Chef is Marty. It's a collection of his recipes. <laughs> it was inspired by Martha Ann Alito, who is also a very good cook. And, and she, when Marty died, she thought the best tribute that could be to him mm -hmm. was to have a cookbook of his his recipes. The thing about him is that he was so remarkable in so many ways. If you just thought about him as a tax lawyer or as a, a professor of tax, uh, he, would, he would be extraordinarily distinguished in those ways. Uh, but all these other talents, golf, uh, uh, chef, and he really was uh, a unique person, and it was a real privilege to be his, to be his friend and to be his, his colleague. You, you include um, some wonderful writings by, by Marty. Do you have a favorite? There's a great introduction of me that, uh, one of those is, is in Marty's own words. In, in, in the audio book, 
Is it yes, it's Marty's? the introduction yes. at the fellowship program, yeah. anniversary at Georgetown. That's we fantastic. had a tape of that. <laughs> but the other was a speech that Marty had written and was it planning to give to the 10th Circuit Judicial Conference in the summer of 2010. When he died in June that year, but his speech was already written out. So I went to the 10th Circuit and I read Marty's speech. I didn't have quite the timing that he would have had, but it was, it was okay. And that talk is the basis for this film that will be in progress, I think, in August they'll begin filming. Is that the Natalie Portman yes. film? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one last question before we turn it over to uh, this, the audience, um, and that is, um, as, as uh, Wendy and Mary have pointed out, um, in, the, in, this, in the book there are excerpts from the opera Scalia Ginsburg, um, and uh, we've, we've um, had excerpts from it at our Second Circuit conference. Um, there have been full performances um, in this, in, in, I know, in, in Virginia and in Glimmerglass. Uh, Glimmerglass sure. is this summer. Glimmerglass is this summer. It's August 4th and 13th. August 4th and 13th. <laughs> Can you tell us something about your decision to include those excerpts? Uh, say something about the opera, anything you'd like about your relationship with Justice Scalia before we turn it over to the students? The opera was written by Derek Wang, who was a music major at Harvard and has a, a master's in music from Yale, and then decided that it would be, it would be helpful to to know a little bit about the law. So he enrolled in his hometown law school, University of Maryland Law School. And when he was in a constitutional law class, he was reading these sometimes dueling opinions, Scalia for the court, Ginsburg in dissent, Ginsburg for the court, Scalia in dissent, and decided that this could make a very funny opera. And in addition, would convey a little bit about, about the law. So to give you the flavor of it, it opens with Justice Scalia's rage aria, which is very Handelian in style. And it goes this way. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says, absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> so that sets up just Scalia. And then I answer him. I tell him that he's seeking bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that like our society, it can evolve. <laughs> so that sets, sets, sets it up. The plot is roughly based on Mozart's magic flute, and Justice Scalia <laughs> has to go through a certain number of trials. <laughs> um, he has been locked up in a dark room, being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> and then I enter through a glass ceiling. <laughs> I, I entered to help him get through these trials. And the commendatore, who is borrowed from Don Giovanni, uh, asked me, how can you come to his assistance? He is your enemy. And I said, no, he's not my enemy. He's my friend. Hmm. And that's the, really the, the theme of the opera, how two people who think differently about some very important things can nonetheless genuinely like each other, enjoy each other's company. One of the things that Justice Scalia would do every now and then 
He'd read one of my opinions. Whether he agreed with it or not, he'd call to correct my grammatical errors. <laughs> <laughs> never sent this through the channels, never on paper, but always in a telephone call. My uh, t typical of Justice Scalia was we disagreed sharply in the Virginia Military Institute case, the question whether Virginia could maintain a facility that offered great advantages, but that was closed to, to women. We went back and forth. It was like a ping pong game many times. Scalia came to my chambers one day and threw down a sheaf of paper and said, Ruth, this is my penultimate draft of my dissent in the VMI case. It's not yet ready to be circulated to the court, but I want to give you as much time as I can to answer it. As we were into June already, and the clock was running out. So I took this draft on the plane with me to Albany. I was going to the Second Circuit Judicial Conference in Lake George. Uh, reading it absolutely ruined my weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but I was grateful that he gave me the extra time to respond. And I think my opinion in the VMI case is ever so much stronger because I had the benefit of Justice Scalia's criticism. One quick footnote. I, I called that case Frontiero by accident. That was an earlier case. So the VMI case, which is officially entitled United States versus Virginia, yes. is, uh, is the case in which she pulled it all together. And she was down there last month, a couple months ago, to celebrate the anniversary of that decision at VMI. And there was a crowd even bigger than this. And up in the, up there, a huge, group of people in identical uniforms, the VMI cadets, who gave her a standing ovation. So, and there were women up there among them. And now I have a photograph in my chambers of the women cadets at VMI who are doing very well. Uh, the school is, is and now, now realizes it made a very wise decision. <laughs> We'll hear uh, now from the audience some questions. We have a hard stop at 5.15. Uh, oh. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> this is great. Well. <laughs> Thank you. If you could, if you ask, ask, your, uh, ask your question, please be brief. Uh, this is just for the Georgetown community. Questions from the Georgetown uh, community. Tell us uh, your name and uh, what year you're in. I'm Allie Ross, uh, class of 2020. And this is the best moment of my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> my question is just um, for all the young women in this room, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges they'll face, and what advice would you give them if you were going to sit down with them? Uh, challenges. Well, for you, the, the challenges in, is more daunting than the ones that we faced. I spoke before about there being explicit gender lines in the law, so women can't be firefighters, can't be police officers, can't be pilots of planes. Those doors are now open to you. But what's left is, is what is called unconscious bias. My best illustration of that is a symphony orchestra. When I grew up, you never saw a woman in the orchestra. The music critics thought that they could tell the difference between a woman playing the violin and a man. Same for other instruments. 
one day someone came up with the brilliant idea, let's drop a curtain so that people who are doing the testing don't see the people who are auditioning. And with that simple device, the drop curtain, women began to show up in symphony orchestras in numbers. Sadly, we can't repeat that in, in every, every area. My favorite decision in that line from the 70s was of a Title VII, that's our principal anti-discrimination law, Title VII case against AT&T for not promoting women into middle management jobs. The women did great on all the standard uh, criteria, but they flunked the last test, the total person test, which was an interviewer interviewing the candidate for promotion. It wasn't a deliberate attempt to screen out women, but the interviewer had a certain comfort level facing someone who looked like himself. If he were confronting a member of a minority group or a woman, there was a strangeness. He felt uneasy. It's getting over that unconscious bias that remains a problem. Together with the, what's called the work-life balance, how do you arrange work so that people can have a family life as well as a work life? I think those are the, the two biggest hurdles. My advice? is find allies among men as well as women who want to change things. And think of yourself, as Bob said I did, uh, as a teacher. So don't react in anger because that's going to be counterproductive. If you call someone a sexist pig, you, you've turned him <laughs> off. So. People asked, was it difficult arguing before the Supreme Court in those early 70s? I said, oh, I felt more like a kindergarten teacher than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> because there was knowledge that I had that they didn't have, and I had to try to communicate in, in a way that they would find appealing. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, thank you so much. It was an honor to hear you speak today. Um, my name is Donna Artuzzi, and I'm a grad student in the School of Foreign Service focusing on security. And I'm wondering, as someone who's interested in hopefully joining the legal profession at some point, um, hopefully both men and women can make equal contributions in all areas of law, but are there areas in which you think that women um, maybe should become more involved, or do you think would be able to make um, more of an impact at this time and hopefully going forward? Women can excel in, in any area of the law that interests them if they're willing to put in the hours of work that it takes to become expert in one area or, or another. So I'd, with no doors being closed, I think women should choose what they feel is there, that they are best equipped to do. Would you like to add to that? Um, in a way, um, there are areas in the law, maybe you're referring to this or asking this question, um, that are still predominantly male by practice. Yes, thank you for rephrasing. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, I am sure there are, but remarkably, the the general trend has been to include women everywhere, and it's much much is owed to Ruth Ginsburg for that, of course. Uh, but the the law also requires now, of course, that you not be discriminated against on the basis of your sex. So we can hope to see men doing legal jobs that perhaps were thought to be reserved for women like estates or something like that back in the day. And that you could be 
a lawyer doing security work for the United States. Right. And, and one extra postscript, which is really something Justice Ginsburg speaks about a lot, is that no matter what area you go into, and it's also a Georgetown tradition, if you do try to give back somehow to either changing the law to make the world a better place for others or tutoring someone, um, there are all sorts of ways to do it, public interest work, pro bono work. And that's something the justice often speaks about, that it's a profession and we are privileged to be in it. So in a sense, we owe a debt back to society to carry on that tradition. And I w would like to say that the Honorable Robert Katzman has been a great leader yes. in that regard. He saw a crying need for people in the toils of the immigration um, system in needing lawyers to represent them. And he really made it happen with this project that is now going forward in, in New York. You have how many, how many lawyers are? We have the Immigrant Justice Corps uh, in the field has uh, 78 fellows. Um, in, in two and a half years, it has served, uh, it has served over 28,000 immigrants and their families. If you look at our, at our fellows, uh, it turns out that most of them are women. Uh, a lot of them are uh, first generation um, Americans. Proud to say that Georgetown Law Center is well represented in terms of the uh, fellows of the Immigrant uh, Justice Corps. And um, if you're interested, as college students, uh, when you graduate, there is something called the Community Fellows Program for college graduates who can, who can work in community-based um, organizations. Um, a large uh, part of the problem is that uh, immigrants live in fear, and um, you can really do something substantial if you uh, try to uh, make their lives uh, easier by giving them a sense that the American dream can be their dream, too. And the, the commitment for the fellows is, what is it? It's two years. It's a two-year guaranteed fellowship uh, with, a, with a prospect of a, uh, of a third year. Um, and the fellows are, are uh, trained uh, in, in a boot camp. Uh, they, they, they then get to work with uh, nonprofit uh, organizations. Uh, a number of the organizations happen to be organizations that, that deal with problems of, of, of women and, uh, and, uh, and children. Um, we have a, the Immigrant Justice Corps has had a rapid response team in Texas that has helped um, over a thousand uh, women uh, and their children. So it's, um, uh, remaking the immigration bar and uh, providing a whole new generation of, of leaders. It's been a, a real inspiration to, to work with these people and, and uh, um, thank you for. Well, it is a sterling example of seeing a need. There was nothing, Bob had nothing when it began and now it has this flourishing fellows, fellows program. I'd like to mention another effort to do what my dear colleague Justice Souter called doing something outside yourself if you're a true professional. So Justice O'Connor saw a need for children to learn about the government. M most elementary school students didn't, you ask what are the three branches of government, they couldn't tell you. So she started this iCivics program Pitch to middle school children. It's now been introduced in schools across the country. But that idea of seeing a need, knowing that you have a talent that can help respond to the need. 
Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. Uh, I'm Oliver, a sophomore from School of Foreign Service. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is in the Can you have one question? Okay. <laughs> uh, in the context of um, gender-based classifications, do you think it is necessary to improve it from the intermediate uh, scrutiny to the strict scrutiny? Uh, will you do that? Do I think it's necessary to have levels of scrutiny? Because I think um, when we deal with racism, we will use the strict scrutiny. So I think we also need to deal with the sexism. There is a need to look with special suspicion at any law that disadvantages a group of people, especially when those people are not proportionately represented in, in legislative decision making or executive decision making. So. Uh, yes, I do think that there is a need to give heightened scrutiny to laws that disadvantage any class of people. This, we have time for one last question. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, my name is John Greenberg, and I'm a student of chemistry at the college. Sorry. And um, I was just wondering, you've had an incredibly impressive tenure on the court. So I was wondering what decision you were most proud of and what most disappointed you. I, that, that question is like asking me which of my six grandchildren <laughs> am, I, <laughs> am I most proud of, oh, all of them. Um, I love my job, and every case is important. So uh, I, I couldn't single out any one case and say, and that's my favorite. I do think a case that has been mentioned, the VMI case, gave me great personal satisfaction. Even the title of the case, U.S. against Virginia. When women first aspired to become leaders in the military, West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy didn't admit them. So litigation was started in the 70s against the military academies. It was started by women who thought they possessed the necessary qualifications but were excluded. By the time we get to the VMI case, it's no longer the women seeking to get in, although there were many who, who did seek admission to VMI. It was the United States government telling the state of Virginia, the government has an anti-discrimination policy you can't exclude people simple, simply on the basis of their gender, whether, whether it's excluding a male from a nursing college in Mississippi or a woman from VMI. So it was the United States government saying that is the policy of the United States. And Virginia, you better get on board. So <laughs> then it, um, Wendy and Mary were with me in February, when we were at VMI, and it was most exhilarating to see, to meet and talk to the women cadets. who are going to be engineers, nuclear scientists. <laughs> so I, I'm, that's, that's one decision of which I'm very proud. I also like the Lily Ledbetter decision, because... <laughs> I was on the losing side. It was five to four decision. But I thought that my colleagues had misinterpreted Title VII. So uh, after describing what Lily's case was really about, my tagline was, the ball is now in Congress's court to correct the error into which my colleagues have fallen. And in very short order, Congress, with huge ma majorities on both sides, passed the Lilly That Better Fair Pay Act that adopted the position that the defense, that the, 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 the dissent took in that, in that case. Justice Ginsburg, it's, it's been a 
extraordinary honor for uh, all of us. Uh, thank you for, for being here. I'd like to thank uh, Wendy Hartnett and, and uh, I mean, Mary Hartnett and Wendy Williams. Um, here's the book. We can get a close up of the book. So, I'd like also to thank uh, Georgetown University President uh, Jack DeJoya, Professor Charles King, Chairman of the Government Department for hosting this uh, symposium. I'd like also to thank uh, uh, Aaron Sharkey, uh, Aaron Hudson, uh, Jeffrey uh, uh, Bible, uh, uh, Mary Haynes, uh, for all of their, their, their support, Andrea Barrow. As noted in your programs, Please exit Gaston Hall and head to the campus ministry hallway on the first floor of this building uh, in order to receive a copy of your, my own words. Uh, make sure to uh, bring along the ticket located uh, in your program. Thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. Thank you.